Part Three of I Was a Teenage Secret Weapon by Richard Sabia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Three Lieutenant Wims unfolded out of the jeep into the jungle mud. The driver pointed to a cluster of tents sagging under the weight of the streaming rain. You'll find Major Hecker in there. Thanks for the ride, Wims said as he wrestled his gear out of the jeep. He located the headquarters tent, and an orderly brought him in to the major. Lieutenant Dolliver Wims reporting for duty, sir, the saluting Wims said crisply. Major Hecker's hand slid wearily to the vicinity of his fatigued and unshaven face in returned salute. Welcome, Lieutenant, to Langtan, Burma's foremost nothing. Wims handed his orders to the major, who said, as he accepted them, "'You'll be taking the third platoon of A Company. They lost their lieutenant two days ago.' The major glanced at the orders and exploded. "'What do they mean? Attached to your command as an observer. I need a platoon leader. What are you supposed to observe?' Wims shifted uneasily. "'I can't rightly say, sir.' The truth of the matter was that Wims didn't really know. His commission had been virtually thrown at him. In Washington he had been vaguely briefed that he was to be sent to the front in Burma on a mission of the utmost importance, and not to breathe a word to anyone. It was only when he alighted from the plane in Rangoon that he fully realized that actually no one had breathed a word to him about what exactly he was to do. His orders merely stated that he was to get as close to the enemy as possible and observe. The major regarded him nastily. What's that insignia you're wearing? They look like question marks. I guess they do, Wims replied unhappily. Well, are they? the major inquired with a soft shout. I guess they are, sir. You guess? The Major now regarded him with open animosity. And I suppose you don't know what they stand for. Well, sir, I tried to find out, but somehow I couldn't get a straight answer. Okay, okay, Lieutenant Cloak and Dagger. But if you don't want questions, why wear the things? If the commies know you're special and catch you. But I'm not no special nothing. I'm just, yeah, sure. The Major poked a grimy finger at the paper before him, and grinned almost savagely. It says here you're to operate with our most forward units. That's just fine. I've got a patrol going out tonight. They will take you close enough to sit in their ever-loving yellow laps. As Wims was leaving, the Major suddenly called after him, "'Say, Lieutenant, since you're some kind of special agent, you probably have an inn at the Pentagon. Will you pass the word that I need a Louis replacement? One that doesn't wear punctuation marks.' The patrol had not been out twenty minutes before it fearfully decided it had better ditch this boy lieutenant, who, with every step, sounded as if he were setting off a room full of mouse traps. At a whispered signal from the sergeant in command, the patrol slid noiselessly off the trail and dropped to the ground as the groping whims went clattering by in the darkness. Within the hour, whims tripped over a Chinese patrol that lay cowering in the ferns as it listened apprehensively to what it thought was an approaching enemy battalion. The next several days were confusing ones for Wims. With little food or sleep, he was hustled from place to place and endlessly questioned by officers of increasing rank. He was passed up to the divisional level, where he was briefly interrogated by a Russian officer advisor to the Chinese headquarters. There seemed to be some disagreement between the Russian and Chinese officers concerning Wims, and they were almost shouting when he was pulled from the room and thrown back into his cell. In the chill early hours of the following morning he was yanked out of an embarrassing nightmare, where he dreamed he went to a hoedown in his briefs. He was squeezed between two furtive men into a shade-drawn limousine with unillumined headlamps, 
and after a frenzied ride the vehicle screeched to a halt. He heard a roaring, and in the darkness he was dimly aware that he was being shoved into an airplane. After that he was certain of nothing as he plunged gratefully back into sleep. Wims was back at the hoedown, only this time without even his briefs. And all the interrogators had stopped dancing and were circling around him, glaring and demanding to know what he was hiding. As they closed in upon him, he was snatched from the dream by two guards, who prodded him out of his cell, down a bleak corridor, and into a large room. The windows were hidden by drawn, dark green shades, and two low-hanging, unshaded electric light bulbs provided a harsh illumination. The chamber was sparsely furnished with a splintered desk, several battered chairs, and a half-dozen Russian M.V.D. officers. A man, so thick and heavy in appearance and movement, that he was obviously a concrete abutment come to life, stepped up to Wims. The man's stony visage cracked in a slow, cold smile as he rumbled in English, Welcome to Moscow, Lieutenant Dolliver Wims. I am Colonel Sergei Bushmilov. I am your friend. The word friend sounded rather squeaky, as if it had not been used in years and needed oiling. Wims glanced around the room. These people were like unshielded reactors throwing off hard radiations of hostility. "'Ah, sure could use a friend,' he said with utmost fervency. "'Good,' said Bushmilov. "'There are some things I wish to know, and you are going to tell me because we are friends. "'I can only give you my name, rank, and serial number, sir.' Wims saw the colonel's face harden and his fist clench. Just then a burst of angry shouting and scuffling erupted in the corridor. Suddenly the door was flung open, and a half a dozen Chinese stormed into the room, trailing a couple of protesting Russian guards. Two of the Chinese were civilian attachés from the embassy, and the remainder were uniformed military intelligence officers. Bushmilov whirled and immediately recognized the foremost man. Colonel Ping! "'What are you doing here?' he exclaimed in startled surprise. Colonel Ping replied in askew English, the only language he had in common with Bushmilov. "'Our American lieutenant, you kid stolen!' he pointed at Wims. Bushmilov unconsciously shifted his bulk to blot Wims from Ping's view. "'You are wrong, Colonel Ping. Your intelligence was not getting nowhere with him.' and we are having more uh, experience in these matters. We think you approve to take him to Moscow. Ah, yes? Then why you sneak away like folding Arabian tent, ah? Huh? Although Bushmilov did not comprehend what Arabian tents had to do with this business, he did understand the accusation. Before he could reply, Ping continued, us a Chinese not fool, comrade colonel. You Russian think us not good like you, like uh, smart, okay? Us not belong Russia like satellite. Us belong us. Us not let you take what you want and no asking. You will give it back, the American officer. Us can make him say secret. Bushmilov stiffened and dropped all pretense at cordiality. Us will... He shook his head in annoyance. I will not do that without order from my superior, Minister Modrilinsky. Now you will be kind to leave. There is business to finish. No go unless us take officer. An angry Bushmilov strode to the door and snarled at the two guards in Russian. One of them dashed away down the corridor. We shall see, Bushmilov sneered at Peng. "'Yes, us shall. Ah!' said Ping, withdrawing his automatic pistol from its holster. The other Chinese did the same, and their movement was duplicated immediately by the Russians. 
No one moved or spoke further until five Russian security guards burst into the room with submachine guns at the ready. The corporal in charge looked at Bushmilov for instructions. The Russian colonel looked long and thoughtfully at the primed Chinese. He had not expected them to go to this extreme. Perhaps they were only bluffing. But one sudden misinterpreted movement or the wrong word, and another ugly incident in an already dangerously long chain might be created to accelerate the deteriorating Sino-Soviet relations. Without specific instructions, he dared not take the responsibility for any untoward action. Bushmilov ordered the guards to stand at ease, and dispatched one of his henchmen to notify his superior of the crisis. "'You being very wise, Comrade Colonel,' Ping said. "'You are being very annoying,' Bushmilov snapped. "'Okay, yes,' Ping replied. "'Chinese People's Republic Ambassador now at Kremlin demand give back American officer. Come soon now, us go. Take lieutenant. You annoying finish, ah!' Bushmilov spoke sharply to his junior officers, who still stood with drawn pistols. One of them came over and stationed himself alongside Bushmilov. He explained to Ping, "'I go along with questioning. My men will shoot anyone who interfere.' Colonel Ping knew his bounds. "'Okay, yes. Us wait. When order come, you give us lieutenant. Us stay. Listen.' Bushmilov turned to Wims. "'You were captured six days before.' Two weeks from now, at this month end, you supposed to be exchanged by Geneva Concordat number seventeen. Now you tell me why your government in such a hurry they cannot wait, and why they make special request to government of Chinese People's Republic for immediate return of you, and why it offered. Twelve Chinese officers, all ranks, to get back only you? I don't know, sir, Wim said in honest surprise. I warn you, if you not cooperating, you not go home at month end. You cannot pretend with us. We check and know much about you. You go in army three months before now. No university education. No military experience, and now you are second lieutenant so quick? How so? Oh, I can tell you all that, Wim said with relief. That ain't no military secret. When we was having basic training, this here general allowed as to how I did some right smart soldiering during maneuvers, and he up and give me a battlefield commission. Bushmilov's eyes were slits. Ha, 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 Bushmilo said without a smile. You Americans, always making joke. I enjoy that good laugh. Now we are serious. It is true, yes, that you are intelligence officer sent to Burma with special mission. We know everything, Bushmilov lied. But we want you to say it with your words, the few details. Can't tell you nothing, cause they ain't nothing to tell. I, I mean, Bushmilov swung up his arm to strike Wims across the face. His hand smacked against the pistol held by the Russian officer standing next to him. The gun went off. The bullet zipped through the window across the courtyard into another office and past the nose of Minister of Internal Security, Modrilinsky. Modrilinsky shouted for his guards, while his aide pointed out the window and yelled, The shot came from Bushmilov's office, see? The glass is broken in his window. Modrilinsky paled. Bushmilov? My truest comrade? Who is there to trust? Oh, this I expect from that filthy plotter, Berjanian, or that sneak Lemchovsky, or Kamachev, and Gorshkinets, and that baby-faced Konevets. They do not fool me, I assure you. They would all like to denounce me and steal my job. <laughs> and the others, I know them all, every last one of them. 
and I'll deal with them. They'll see. But Bushmilov. Several guards with submachine guns burst into the room. Those windows, Modrileski screamed. Shoot them. Kill the divinist Platos. The guards were uncertain which windows Mordraleski was indicating with his wildly waving arms, but they had no intention of risking the displeasure of the top man of the MVD. They tentatively sprayed all the windows around the courtyard with bullets, and when they received no censure from their chief, they went at it with gusto. Mordraleski was too busy shouting orders to other guards to give them any further attention. The sound of the firing was assurance enough that his orders were being obeyed. By the time he had dispatched men to get Bushmilov and neutralize other potential plotters, the occupants of most of the offices overlooking the courtyard were crouching at the windows, shooting indiscriminately at each other. "'I can't believe it about Bushmilov,' Mordraleski shouted to his aide over the den. "'You know he was at the Kremlin yesterday with Shaposnik. The aide shouted back. And you know how close Shapotnik is to the premier. Maybe they have discovered our plan, and Bushmilov, as your successor, was ordered to liquidate you. Mordraleski slapped his forehead. Of course. We must act at once. Send our man to Marshal Masianko and tell him it is time. He must get his trusted troops into the city before the others suspect what is happening, especially that Kamashev. Major Kamashev of the MVD put in a hasty call to the Minister of Transport. I am forced to phone because of a sudden emergency. Mordraleski must have gotten wind of our plans. His men are besieging my office. You must get General Godorovich to move his men into the city at once. And watch out for the foreign minister. I think he and Lemachovsky are up to something. Major Lemachovsky of the MVD was listening to the foreign minister. The premier has ordered the arrest of the minister of heavy industry for plotting with General Plekoskaya to bring in troops to seize the government. As soon as General Zinolov arrives with his troops and we are in control, I will teach these vile counter-revolutionaries that they cannot plot against the party and the people with impunity. And be careful. I think the Minister of Hydroelectric Power is involved with your Colonel Berjanian. Colonel Berjanian of the MVD was shouting into the phone. Why can't I get the Minister of Hydroelectric Power? If you don't want a vacation in Siberia, you had better get my call through. I'm sorry, Comrade Colonel, the harried operator whined, but it isn't my fault. Can I help it if all of Moscow decides to use the telephones all at once? The lines are still tied up. I will keep trying. Come. Berjanian slammed down the phone just as an aide rushed in. Colonel, I have good news. Our men have gained control of most of the immediate hallway, and we have captured the laboratory from Captain Konovets. Wonderful. Berjanian beamed as he hastily left the room. General Kodorovich's command car rattled and bounced along the rough shoulder of the highway past his stalled 71st Motorized Infantry Division. He found the van of his column tangled with the rear of the 124th Armored Division under General Plekoskaya. Kodorovich sought out Plekoskaya and found him at table under some trees having a fine lunch. "'Would you mind getting your army out of the way?' General Kodorovich said to General Plekoskaya, I have emergency orders to proceed immediately to Moscow. So have I, Plekoskaya replied, wiping his lips. Won't you join me for lunch? I haven't time, Kodorovich snapped, glaring accusingly at the roast fowl and wine on the white linen. Oh, but you have, my dear Kodorovich, Plekoskaya said pleasantly. You see, neither of us is going anywhere for the moment. There is a brigade of the 48th blocking the road ahead. The 48th from Kiev? Kodorovich exclaimed. What is a brigade of the 48th doing up here? Looking for its sister brigade from which it was separated when the 116th mechanized, in its hurry to reach Moscow, cut through their column. The 116th mechanized? 
Kodorovich exclaimed again. He wanted to stop talking in questions, but all this was coming so fast and unexpectedly. "'Don't even inquire of me about them,' Plekoskaya said, shuddering. "'They are so disorganized and tangled with two other armored divisions, whose designations I don't even know. It all happened because they were trying to outrace each other to the trunk highway, and they arrived at the intersection almost simultaneously.' You can't possibly imagine the hideous clatter when you have two stubborn armored divisions and an obstinate mechanized one all trying to occupy the same road at once. Ah, I could hear it all the way back here. Pakuskaya belched delicately. General, do wash off the dust of the road and join me at table. No, thank you. If that's all the delay is, it should be cleared soon and we'll be moving again. I want to be with my division. General Kodorovich, you evidently don't understand what has happened. The word that has been passed from the most forward units, which are in the city itself, to the rear ones, indicates that Moscow is the hub of one vast military traffic jam, thirty to perhaps fifty miles deep, and growing worse all the time as new groups are moving in. "'But I must get to the city,' Kodorovich insisted. "'I have orders to surround the Kremlin, seal off MVD headquarters, and—' "'Ease your mind,' Lekuskaya interrupted. "'The Kremlin is well surrounded. "'General Smoledin is deployed around the walls. "'General Alexev is deployed around General Smoledin. General Paretsev is deployed around Alexev, and so on to the outskirts of the city. Ah, those of us out here, of course, cannot deploy off the roads, for who knows, tomorrow the Minister of Agriculture may be Premier, and he may not take it kindly if we trample the collectives. But how can you sit there and do nothing, when the people's government is in some kind of danger? Kodorovich said with some heat. It is very simple, Plekoskaya said, with mild irritation and sarcasm. I merely bend at the knees and hips, and have a lunch of a weight adequate enough to keep me from floating off my chair and rushing about seeking trouble. Of course, it takes years of experience to learn how to do this, and most important, when. In kindlier terms, Plekoskaya continued, Whatever it is that is happening in the Kremlin and the other hotbeds of intrigue will have to happen without us. There is no telling who, if anyone, is in control. Conflicting orders have been coming over the military radio depending upon which click controls which headquarters. Why, do you know, my dear Kodorovich, already this morning, the 124th, has alternately been ordered to march to Moscow and a dozen other places, including downtown Siberia. Kodorovich did not smile at Plekoskaya's slight humor. He was squinting anxiously through the bright sunlight at the immobile column of men and vehicles jammed along the road into the far blue distance. End of Part 3